there are some combinations of vitamins and minerals that you don't absorb quite as, quite as efficiently you take them together. Like I think someone told me if you have a lot of vitamin D, like you take a vitamin D supplement, that might stop you from absorbing iron. That's also in that supplement. Sometimes they don't work well together. But that could be able to if you don't get 100% efficiency, but it's so hard to take a supplement. Um, oh, yeah, so there's other category cofactors other than metal ions. Some cofactors are, are organic molecules, meaning carbon containing molecules, uh, like this one right here. And those type of cofactors that are organic molecules are called coenzymes, which I always thought was a bit of a confusing term because you know, that means co means with, so with enzymes. Metal ions are also with enzymes. But for, for some reason, this term is reserved for organic cofactors and coenzymes. Now, uh, this particular um, coenzyme that you see here um, is found in several different types of enzymes. Lots of different enzymes use this one. Uh, amongst other proteins that it uses this one is a protein called hemoglobin that helps carry oxygen. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about the hemoglobin protein is it uses not only this heme coenzyme, but it also combines it with iron. In other words, it's perfectly okay for an enzyme to be using both types of cofactors, the coenzyme and the melanin cofactor together. There's a, it's a computer rendition of what a hemoglobin protein looks like, and the red blobs you see there are the uh, cofactors um, where it holds the oxygen as the function of the oxygen proteins. There's a bunch of O2 molecules sticking themselves on those cofactors. Um, the, uh, the vitamins that we take, well, we have to get from our foods, or if you take a vitamin and mineral supplement, Vitamins are coenzymes. Uh, folic acid, niacin, riboflavin, thymine, vitamin K, vitamin E. All of these are uh, coenzymes, organic proteins. And so if you think about it, when you take a vitamin and mineral supplement, they should just call it cofactor supplement, because that's what it is. It's, it's, it's metal ions and, and coenzymes uh, to work as cofactors. Um, so if you ever take a nutrition class, your instructor will refer to these same molecules as vitamins, whereas here in this class, we refer to them as uh, coenzymes. And sometimes they actually use different terms, like what a nutrition class causes, they call the vitamin niacin. In cellular biology, they call coenzyme N D B. And what they call vitamin B2 or vitamin B in nutrition class, here in cellular biology class, they call them FAD, and you can see some different names, pantothenic acid, 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 the vitamin is coenzyme A or coa. Uh, and while I've got this slide up, I think it's pretty good for you, a couple of some things that come up uh, in a few weeks. Um, these two coenzymes, NAD and FAD, specialize in carrying electrons from the enzyme. Remember that. Uh, electrons are these negatively charged particles that orbit around the outside of the atoms. Well, some enzymes have to be able to work with electrons, almost like the electrons are one of the substrates of the enzyme. And these coenzymes allow the enzyme to carry electrons. They help carry pairs of electrons. This coenzyme right here, coenzyme A, is also going to come up in a couple of weeks. And it helps the Enzyme to carry a two carbon group called a seal. Here's two carbons linked together in organic chemistry. They sometimes call that a seal group. And what I'm saying is this coenzyme A, its job is to link on to a seal group to help the enzyme hold the whole group with a seal group. Yeah.
good stuff. First three all worked with other molecules. The first three you had binding sites or active sites, it's called the case of that side, but they all had these crevices on the side where they bound to other molecules and then did something with those molecules. Enzymes changed those molecules, the molecules they bind to with a chemical reaction, transport proteins, take the molecules into the cell membrane, and receptors. Well, receptors don't go too much to the light and they bind, but they at least alert the inside of the cell. The uh, fibrous proteins are kind of uh, different from the other ones on this list. Fibrous proteins are not highly folded, and they don't. Fibrous proteins don't have a binding site. The, the fibrous proteins don't interact. They don't have a site where they latch on other molecules. And fibrous proteins really don't carry out any kind of chemical reaction or anything like that. There's a cartoon that takes on the fibers, but to notice it's not really highly folded. It's, it has a little bit of hills and valleys to it, but for the most part, it's mostly straight. Um, fibers proteins are really there to add structural framework to tissue, to reinforce tissue to make them stronger. And so I always tell my students think of fibers proteins as like those pieces of reinforcing bar steel that you see inside the construction projects where they're making something like an overpass or a building or a parking structure out of concrete. The concrete is what most of the building is made out of, but they put these rebar pieces of steel inside the concrete to reinforce it and make it stronger as well. Think of this as the tissues of your body, and the rebar steels are the fibrous proteins that are embedded within the tissue uh, to make it stronger. Here's a photograph of uh, some sort of tissue in the body. And there's little black dots on the cells. And black, so those are the nucleus of the cells. But notice that there's all these things crisscrossing. There's the big, thick, tingling lines here. Those are fibrous proteins. And these little black lines crisscrossing there are also uh, fibrous proteins. So all the cells are embedded in this network of, of uh, fibrous proteins crisscrossing back and forth. And there, there are several different types of fibrous proteins that are found inside uh, our bodies and other living things. Uh, but these really are uh, some of the most abundant types of fibrous proteins. The collagen proteins are the ones that you see in, in the red here on this diagram. And they are the strongest of the fibrous proteins. When you think of a collagen protein, think of a molecule, a molecule that like a strong leather strand or rope or something. I don't think I can break this thing. It's not really that big, but I don't think I can break it no matter how hard I pull it. So leather is just a intrinsically very right, tough, strong molecule. And if you can shrink yourself down and somehow grab hold of a collagen protein, that's where you'll feel it. And so the more collagen proteins a tissue has in it, the stronger, tougher, and more leathery that tissue is going to be. Um, you find this collagen protein in a lot of tissues in the body, but one of the areas we find most of it is are things called tendons and ligaments. This is a tendon right here, this little raise on right there. Tendons link together muscles to bones, and they have to be very strong with a huge amount of force for the muscles. So I can't feel it, but some people can lift hundreds of pounds you know, using their bicep muscles. So all that hundreds of pounds of force has to be transferred to the to your skeleton. And this little tiny bit of tissue right there, so it darn well better be a real tough, non-tearing tissue. Um, and, and ligaments are much the same thing, except ligaments, instead of joining muscle to bone, ligaments link bone to bone. But the same thing, there's a lot of stresses and strains. You can use your skeleton, especially if you lift heavy things. And so you need a little tough, leathery tissues to hold them. The uh, black lines you see on this picture of some tissues are a smaller type of uh, fibrous protein called elastin, or sometimes they call it elastic fibers. Um, think of elastin proteins, structural proteins, as being rubber band. They're not as strong as collagen, 
but they have the advantage of being very stretchable, being the longer size, and then spontaneously will refer back to their smaller size. Something that obviously uh, college and college are very capable of doing. I remember somebody, somebody was lecturing on this, and they said, you could demonstrate both by pinching your skin a little bit. Under your skin, you find collagen and elastin fibers. If you pull it up, you can't rip it off. But you want to tear your skin off anyway, but you can't rip it off, and that's because of the collagen fibers in there are holding it strongly in place. But when you let go, it pulls itself down flat, and that is because of the elastin fibers uh, pulling it flat. The uh, last of these structural proteins I want to mention is called keratin. That clock's about two minutes off, so I'll uh, hold on for just a couple more. Uh, this keratin protein, generally you find the structures on the outside of your body. Your skin cells, or at least the, the outermost skin cells, are stuffed full of this keratin protein. Your hair is also made of cells that are stuffed full of keratin protein. Your fingernails are made out of uh, keratin protein also. When you think about your fingernails, it almost seems like they're made out of a plastic material. So that's the way you think of it. It's very hard, kind of waterproof, tough plastic protein. And it's not just on our human bodies. Most animals that live on the land or in the air have keratin on the outsides of their bodies. Uh, the, the fur of animals, which corresponds to our hair, of course, and their claws, which are like our fingernails, are made out of keratin. Feathers of birds are made out of keratin. Uh, the scales you find on a lizard or a snake or on a chicken's feet are also made out of keratin. And I think fish scales are also made out of keratin. Also. Uh, so, anyway, all, not of us, all animals, but many members of the animal kingdom have keratin for their, for their skin and all the structures on the outside. Of the skin. Okay, that's probably a good stopping point. We'll see you guys at uh, 2 o'clock for the exam. If you haven't signed in, uh, we'll see you guys at 2 o'clock for the exam.